In fact, I had given this particular problem that E naught E naught in terms of F mu nu and H core mu nu or H core mu nu, all right. So many people got confused. I just want to kind of discuss for a minute, you know. So basically all you have to write and this is, it was written explicitly that it is for closed shell. So that was also not a problem. So either you can write in spin orbital and do a integration or you can directly write in terms of space orbital which is also given to you which is basically 2 times sum over h a a equal to 1 to n by 2 which I had called h i i does not matter i i is nothing but phi i h phi i okay phi a h phi a plus a b then you had 2 j a b right minus k a b. So, this all goes to n by 2. So, each of them are in space orbital. What you are expected to do is to now expand this in terms of atomic orbitals and then prove what I had given. There are several expressions that one can give, but that is an expression that, that is very useful because at the end of the Hartree Fock, the reason it is useful at the end of the Hartree Fock, we have F, we have H core mu nu, and of course, you have P. Right. So, these are already available. So, we do not want to write another expression for energy, any other expressions. So we want to write the energy of expression in terms of these quantities which are already available, just multiply. Remember, many of the things that are being done ha are also done with an understanding that the computation would eventually become simplified. Okay. I can write in various form, but I have to make the computation simplified. So, already certain things are done. So, we already have P mu nu. Okay, you already have F mu nu and of course, we have H core mu nu, no question about it, okay. At the, at the point where the SCF has converged, this of course has nothing to do with convergence, this is one time calculation, these two are converged quantities. Using these three quantities, you directly write the energy, that was the essential idea of that paper, of that particular question. And you can start from here and do all your exercise and do a little manipulation to get that. It is not very difficult, okay. Little bit of manipulation is required. I may also mention before I go forward that, that the Fock operator in spin orbital, so I call it f of let us say x1 is equal to h of r1, those who have difficulty in writing, sum over j or a equal to 1 to n by 2. Okay. Now complete it. Complete this. Complete this in terms of spin orbital. Chi I have used A. So please remember. Chi A star 2, correct. Then 1 by R12, 1, 1 minus P12 chi a 2 d tau 2. I think some people had even difficulty in writing this. So, I want to mention we had used j, I am using a, it does not matter. The indices, that is one thing that you have to be very comfortable is to write the indexes, indices. And please remember the index integral in terms of coordinates and spin orbital, you have to be very, very careful. The coordinates are dummy. The spin orbital is not a dummy because spin orbital is a each spin orbital is a different function. So, if I integrate different function results are different. So, if I have f of x or it is a f 1 x dx and f 2 x dx, they are not same. Remember they are all definite integral, let us say a to b, simple calculus, they are not same if f 1 is different from f 2. However, f1 of x dx a to b is equal to f1 of y dy a to b. 
here the function form is same, coordinate has only changed. Some people have confusion even of this. So, when you are using the coordinates, the coordinate is not an issue, this spin orbitals are issue. So, I have to sum over A because for each spin orbital, the form of chi A is different. Chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, they are all different. In terms of spin orbital, this is 1 to n, okay. So, for each spin orbital, the form of chi A is are different and hence I have to explicitly take care, this is no longer dummy. But whether this spin orbital has electron 3, electron 4, electron 1, electron 10, it does not matter which electron because that is integrated. One of these integrations is being done and I repeat, there is only one electron which is integrated. You might wonder what about the electron 3, electron 4, it does not matter because I am summing over the spin orbital and that is what turns out that when I am summing over spin orbital, it is effectively summing over all electrons, okay. So that is what it, that is what it turns out. So instead of summing over electrons, I am summing over spin orbitals, electrons are just dummy. So you take one electron, take its average on the spin orbital chi A. Another electron is actually in a different spin orbital that is also being integrated because there is a sum. It is just that I am calling that inter, inter electron also 2. Because if I call it 3, it makes no difference, the result would be identical. So I am basically summing over all the electrons. So that is another confusion. People think that okay, there are n electrons, where am I averaging over all the n electrons? I am averaging over all the n electrons. It is just that I am not calling them electron 3, electron 4, electron 5, okay, I can call that. So then you will have a very simple picture as if electron 1 is first spin orbital, electron 2 is in second spin orbital, electron 3 is in third spin orbital, if I write it separately. So basically if I break this out, for one of them I write 2, another I write 3 and so on, you will actually see that all the integrals, all the electrons are integrated. So that is a very important part to realize and of course self interaction has not been taken. One with one itself is not taken because Coulomb and exchange cancel and I, I repeated that part. So self interaction is actually physically not taken. You might wonder what happens, why, why there are only, if I say 2, 3, 4, 5, what happened to the other electron? It actually is not there. So but on the other hand when I do spin orbital, I have A equal to 1, that will be taken care when F acts on a specific spin orbital chi B it will take care of the spin orbital. That particular, whenever chi A is equal to chi B, it will become 0. Whenever that, so when I write F of F acting on a chi B to give epsilon B chi B, whenever this summation A will be equal to B, that will give 0. So there is no error being done. These are all some small, small uh, problems that I want to plug holes, okay. So this is a very important way to understand how do, how am I getting from a two particle Coulomb operator and an n electron wave function, eventually a one electron operator by integration and that n electron wave function is also a single determinant, otherwise you cannot get such a simple form. So n electron wave function is a single determinant and that essentially leaves you with the Fock operator which in a canonical form is just this. So that is again it does not matter whether f of 1, f of 2, f of 3 is an eigenvalue equation of an operator. So it is a one particle equation, so it does not matter whether that part coordinate is 1, 2, 3. Again I just repeat, if I write this, this is identical to writing as f of 1 chi i 1 equal to epsilon i chi i 1 or f of 2 chi i 2 chi i 2, does not matter. It is an operator eigenvalue equation, it is a single particle operator. What is the coordinate of the electron does not matter. So many, some of you I saw that were more worried about this coordinate of the electron. Please understand that is the first part of quantum mechanics that the electrons are indistinguishable. So that really does not matter. It is an operator eigenvalue equation. What matters are the spin orbitals, they are different, okay. So and please do not put epsilon i of 1, huh? epsilon i is a number, the function is only chi i, 
So, you, you can see that this, this is a number, you do not write epsilon i of 1, epsilon i of 2, it has no meaning because that is a constant, it is the same, all right. We will go forward, assuming the core Hartree-Fock is done, there are a lot of issues of course which you have to discuss before you leave Hartree-Fock and we will spend next 2-3 classes on discussion on that. So, one of the things that I first want to uh, go forward is a technical issue is that note that we discussed this later rooms and we have used it in the Hartree fock right what are the later rules that we have used in Hartree fock that the hamiltonian expectation value with respect to a single determinant correct and this is something that we have done where psi naught is a single determinant chi 1 chi 2 to chi n Note again, this means it is a determinant, I have just write, written the main diagonal, again I have not written 1, 2, 3, n, it is un, unimportant, I am again repeating, it is a function of n electron, however, and that is understood. So, this is the main diagonal of the determinant, that is how we write in a symbol, but actually it is a determinant, where one of the spin orbitals, each spin orbital is a row or coordinate is a column or vice versa, it does not matter, and you have a 1 by square root n factorial stuck in for normalization, do not forget that. We do not write it in the shorthand abbreviation, but when you write in the long form, there is a 1 by square root n factorial, so do not forget it as a determinant. So, this basically is an average value of the Hamiltonian with respect to a particular psi naught. So, what does it mean? Average value means it is a matrix element of the Hamiltonian, but the right and the left both are identical. So, in a bigger picture of determinant space, this is a diagonal element. You can say this is a diagonal element in a determinant space, okay. If determinants are my basis, which is what it is because you remember I discussed full CI where determinants are basis. So, in that basis determinant, this is only one element. How many determinants are there? If I have m spin orbitals, m c n, okay, that was the part of the first quiz. M C n determinants are there, out of M C n determinants, if I write the matrix element of the Hamiltonian, then what is the matrix size? It will be M C n by M C n, right, out of which this is only one element, but a very, very important element, okay, one element which is diagonal. Why there are M C n? Because when I do Hartree fock or otherwise, if I have a basis of M spin orbitals, I can construct M C n determinant. Even when I am doing Hartree Fogg, remember that the eigenvalue equation gives me many more equations, even in a Ruthan basis, okay. So, I have more spin orbitals than I required. So, I can construct more determinants out of the spin orbitals. What we want to do is that the Slater actually did a rules which almost all, all encompass all types of matrix elements. So, what are the other types of matrix elements? So, first type, this is a type 1, is when both left and right determinants are identical. So, I want to put this now in a more general footing. They are identical determinants, which means they are expect their average value with respect to that particular determinant. It so happens that this can be Hartree for, but it need not be, okay. In case that psi naught has this n spin orbitals, then we know the result which you have done before is again I write sum over i chi i h chi i plus half i less than j chi i chi j anti symmetrized chi i chi, okay. So that is the result, whichever is the chi i. So, I, I give lot of practice problems for this. For example, if I have a 2 electron, I can have 1, 2 as the determinant, 1, 2 is the spin orbital, not coordinate. So, if you just want to be very sure, let me write this as a chi 1, chi 2. This could be a determinant. If I have, let us say, 4 spin orbitals, then I have other determinants, chi 1, chi 3, chi 1, chi 4, right? There will be 6 determinants. So, let us take a simple case, chi 2, chi 3 chi 2, chi 4, chi 3, chi 4, right. 
So, if I have 4 spin orbitals, 2 electrons, then 4 C 2 is 6. So, these are my 6 determinants. I can pick up any one determinant and calculate the Hamiltonian expectation value. It has nothing to do with Hartree Fock, forget about Hartree Fock. Given the determinants, given the spin orbitals in the determinant, I should be able to write it. So, your ground state may be phi, chi 1, chi 2, but if I give you chi 1, chi 3, you should be able to write the determinant chi 1, chi 1, chi 3 h, chi 1, chi 3, you should be able to write this in terms of chi 1, chi 3. So, your i will now not become 1 to 2, right? I will become 1 and 3, whichever. So, your your 1 to n was just lexically ordered. If I order them, because 1, 2, 3, 4, n is just a number, symbol for me. But basically, it means whatever spin orbitals are actually included, they have to be summed up. So, this will have chi 1 h chi 1 plus chi 3 h chi 3. Similarly, this will have chi 1 chi 3 and so on. And this can be further spin integrated. I have already told you how to do that. You will get 2 times Coulomb, 1 times exchange and so on. And depending on whether it is a parallel spin, anti parallel spin, exchange will vanish or not vanish. Okay. So, all those you should be able to do because I have not specified what is chi 1 chi 3. They are spin orbital, they are not space orbital. Okay. So, for example, your chi 1 can be phi 1 alpha and chi 3 can be uh, phi 2 alpha. Okay. So, then you will have a different form of space integration. You will have exchange surviving. Okay. Coulomb, of course, will always be there, but exchange will survive because they have a parallel spin. On the other hand, if your chi 1 is phi 1 alpha, and chi 2 is phi 2 phi 1 beta. So, that is for this determinant. Then of course, the, the exchange will not survive. You will only have a Coulomb term because we have already told you that all pairs of electrons have Coulomb interaction, only parallel have exchange. But this parallel and anti-parallel concept comes only when I do integration of a spin. As far as writing in terms of spin orbitals, I do not care. That is a generic expression. That is a big advantage in terms of spin orbital. This will automatically come in as a result of integration. The fact that the parallel spins have exchanged. So, this is not this is not a result that I am going to force it. Remember, this is an outcome of the spin integration. So, that is why I always say the Hun's rule is an outcome. Hun's rule is not fundamental. Hun's rule is an outcome of the antisymmetry. Because I have an antisymmetric determinant, I get this. And then I do a spin integration, I get Hun's rule. So, I am not going to impose that. I am just telling you the outcome that if you do this integration, you will have parallel spins having exchange, anti parallel spins without exchange. Okay? And that is the reason exchange is stabilized. So, the parallel spins get stabilized compared to the anti parallel spins in the same orbitals. So, obviously, it means the that implies the Hun's rule. Okay, but that will automatically follow. What we want to do now is to have a Slater rule where a type 2 Slater rule where of course, left and right are not identical. Okay. So, that is something that you should be able to do, but here also requires practice, but you should be able to do. But if I have a determinant, let us say chi 1, chi 2, just give a same example here, H and another of the 6 determinants. So, let us say chi 1, chi 3 or it could be chi 3, chi 4. So, several possibilities are there. Any 6 can come here, any 6 can come here, right. Then only I will have a entire 6 by 6 matrix in terms of the determinant space. So, Slater of course, found out all the rules. So, Slater rules essentially can tell you all possibilities. So, type 2 is a possibility where one of the determinants either left or right does not matter, determinants differ from the other, differs from the other by one spin orbital. That is the occupation of the spin orbitals in two determinants are identical except one. I hope I clear like here there is no difference between left and right because they are identical determinants. So, I am now looking at a type 2 where one of the determinants either the left or the right does not matter 
differ from the other by one occupation. So now tell me, is it is this type two? As everybody is in sync, because you have a chi one, chi two, you have a chi one, chi three. So there is only one difference. Is this type two the second one? No, because there are difference of two. Both are different. So this this we will handle later. So right now I am talking of only type two, where there is a difference of only one spin orbital. So so this is basically the type that we are discussing and a very generically let me write down the type in the following manner and I think that is the notation that you should now understand. The same psi 0, I am just using the same psi 0, h on the left, on the right I am making an interchange of one spin orbital a replaced by one spin orbital r. Now this will have a significance in the context of Hartree Fock. In the context of Hartree Fock, whatever are occupied in psi naught is occupied orbitals when I have solved the Hartree Fock problem. So let us assume that the psi naught is Hartree Fock, in which case the A is an occupied orbital and R is a virtual orbital or unoccupied orbital. So that is what it means. So what is psi AR? Let me write down psi naught. So psi naught is chi 1, chi 2, etc., chi A minus 1 chi a, chi a plus 1, blah, 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 up to n. So, chi a is some number, let us say 4. So, I have just written explicitly chi 3, chi 4, chi 5 and the rest I am not writing. Around a I am writing deliberately. Then what is psi a r? Psi a r is exactly the same form except that a is replaced by r and the rest remains same. Only one number is changed, one spin orbital is changed. So that is called IAR. How can I change this? If this is already my Hartree Fock, then these are called occupied orbitals. So this occupied orbital can be changed by what? It cannot be changed by any another occupied orbital. It has to be changed by an unoccupied orbital. If I change by another occupied orbital, determinant will become 0, correct? That cannot survive because two spin orbitals will be identical. So I must change. So in the context of Hartree Fock, if psi 0 is Hartree Fock, these A and R will have a specific notation, they are occupied, unoccupied. However, at this point I am not bothered, I am just saying that the psi A R is a determinant formed by changing one of the spin orbitals chi A in psi 0 by chi R, which was, unpre which was not present. So I would rather say at this point, uh, more generally psi A R is a determinant formed from psi 0 whatever is my psi 0 by changing or replacing the spin orbital chi a by chi r. Of course, the chi r should not be present in psi 0 that is that is understood because otherwise it will become 0, okay. And obviously, a cannot be equal to r because if a is equal to r, I am not doing any change. That is also clear. So, in the context of Hartree Fock, however, which is going to be the context that we are going to discuss, this will be always occupied, this will be always virtual, okay. That is only because of our definition, because context of Hartree Fock essentially means as long as this is Hartree Fock determined. But the rule that this letter did is, of course, very general. So I am placing this as a very general thing that whatever is my determinant need not be Hartree Fock, need not, it has some orbitals, this has some orbitals. A R essentially means it is exactly same determinant, only A is replaced by R. That is the meaning of the symbol, okay. Then this letter gave the rule. As usual, there is a 2 A and 2 B. What is A? A is the 1 electron part, B is the 2 electron part. So H also has a sum over H of I and plus 1 by R i j. So remember in this case, this was my A this was my B. So I am just going to write separately or together, it does not matter. The first part is very simple. This will become chi i, chi a, sorry, h, chi r, that is it, plus. So the one electron part is absolutely simple. Unlike here, where it is sum over n numbers, here it is only one number. That is a matrix element of the one electron operator. H with the one that is replaced 
and the one that is that is replaced by and that it is very easy to see which will come on the left which will come on the right because psi 0 contains chi a this contains chi r. Note that when I am writing psi a r, psi a r does not have chi r, a chi a. Psi a r has chi r, it is just that the a comes here, but a comes here only to tell that from here I delete this. So, a is missing actually. So, whatever is coming on the left on the bottom subscript is actually missing. Whatever is coming here is actually present. So, it is very clear how to write this. If I interchange this, it will be chi r, it will be chi a. So, it is also very easy to see how do I write. So, that will be my first term and only one term. Again, I am not proving it, but the proof is very similar. If I do exactly the same multiplications, uh, the expansion on both left and the right hand side, now you will see that every case this chi a and chi r will cause an orthogonality problem. Because remember, of course, very important is that the chi r is orthogonal to chi a. I mean, that I must ensure. And which is obvious because my spin orbital basis, whatever basis I am replacing, they are orthonormal. So, they are orthonormal occupied orbital, virtual orbital. So, orthogonality is assumed. So, because of orthogonality, everything will everything will become 0 except when the position of chi a here and the position of chi r here is identical. So, the rest will integrate to 1. This part will only come out, but there will be there will be enough number of terms because n factorial here, n factorial here. So, for each term n factorial there will be one term like that, maybe 1, maybe 2. So, n factorial such term will be there, which again multiplies with 1 by n factorial, the square root n factorial here, 1 by square root n factorial here, giving you only one term. Okay? Out of this n factorial term, many will be integration over coordinate 1, some will be coordinate 2, some will be, but does not matter. I, I again repeat it. I repeat that the coordinate integration is immaterial, they are dummy. So, eventually all of them will have same value. There will be n factorial such term which will be multiplied by 1 by n factorial to give you only one term. So, rest any time this side expansion is different from this side expansion, it will become 0. Because chi a and chi r will have different coordinates which will not integrate with h and that will become 0. Now, that takes care of the fact that there is this is actually sum over h of i. So, h1, h2, it takes care of that fact that all those fa factors will now be taken care. So, leaving you with only one term where chi a, h, chi r. Again, you can do this for a two electron problem. I would again request you to do a practice problem, expand this, expand this and just see with all 1 by 2 everything. So, that you have a and remember then this will have h1 plus h2 there will be two terms coming from the Hamiltonian. Okay? Please do that practice. Let me now just write the, the two electron part will be good practice. Let me now write down the rest of the term. Then you have sum over b, I will expand this term, chi a chi b anti chi r Just like here, but here each of i and j were summed up. Here again, one of the spin orbitals on left and the right will be fixed. So, there is no summation. Remember, a and r are specific indices. So, there cannot be summation. The other one can be anything. However, obviously, b cannot be a, b cannot be r. Because if b is a or b is r, this integral will become 0 because it is an anti symmetrized integral. The Coulomb and the exchange will cancel to be 0, not that the integral will be 0. So, I can write b as 1 to n formally because anyway r is not included and even if b is equal to a, it is 0. So, formally I can write this expression. I hope it is clear to everybody that if b is equal to a for example, then you will have chi a chi a anti symmetrized chi r chi b. So, it does not matter chi r chi a whatever it is there. So, if a is equal to b then it becomes chi a chi b, b is equal to a and this is obviously 0 because you have chi a chi a chi r chi a 
minus chi a chi a chi a chi r which can be written again as a chi a. So, it is actually 0. Okay. So, I, I hope all of you are familiar in writing this. This will become chi a 1, chi a 2, 1 by r 1, 2, chi r 1, chi a 2, right? d tau 1, d tau 2 minus you can interchange this or you can interchange this chi a 1, chi a 2, 1 by r 1, 2, chi r 2, chi a 1, okay. Now, clearly you can see this is same as this by another dummy variable interchange of 1 and 2. So, you should be able to do all this practice, but the point is that for all anti, anti symmetrized matrix elements, either the left or the right pair cannot be same for anti symmetrized matrix elements. But each, each of the integral will survive, but their result will be identical. So, hence eventually I need not write this and I can actually write an expression as b equal to 1 to n as if it includes chi a, but no harm done because that is anyway 0 and I have not included b equal to chi r, no harm done because that is also 0. I have included something which is 0, I have not included something which is 0. So, that is a good thing about 0, <laughs> include, do not include, nothing matters, okay. But remember, when you want to program, of course, you should not program b equal to 1 to all n, you should program except, excepting chi a. So, there you must write b not equal to a, if at all, you sum all except a, I mean to be more precise, because that is meaningless, it is 0. So, instead of double summation, you now have a single summation only on one of the spin orbitals because other two are fixed and again this comes out again please check this with a very simple example like this and here there is only one term. So, you see a very nice progression in the A type of Hamiltonian which is sum of one electron Hamiltonian, I had a sum over n terms which is now replaced by only one term, no sum. For the two electron part, I had a double summation which is now replaced by a single summation. So, you see the nice progression of reduction of sums for this and note also that there is no half factor here, that is important to realize, okay. This type 2 is very nice and just here I will spend the time before I go to type 3. Type 3 will be obviously where 2 one of the determinant differ from the other by two spin orbitals and type 4 will be more than 2 and I will argue that the type 4 onwards everything is 0. So, I need to only discuss type 3 after this, but before I do that let me just pause here and reflect on this particular quantity that we have got. So, let us assume now psi naught is Hartree Fock, we have done the Hartree Fock. So, now they are Hartree Fox spin orbitals and note my Fock operator, I had written down again. So, my Fock operator was h of 1 plus sum over b equal to 1 to n chi b star 2 1 by r 1 to 1 minus p 1 to chi b 2 d tau 2, note the Fock operator, okay. This put it on the side line. Can you see that this integral? psi naught h when this is Hartree Fock, please remember this Hartree Fock. So, this is the unoccupied orbital of the Hartree Fock, this is occupied orbital is nothing but chi a f chi r. I hope you can show this, it is very easy to see. Look at the Fock operator, the first term is obvious because Fock has h, I have chi a h chi r, that is obvious. The second term I have a summation chi b star 2 chi b 2 and if I do chi a f chi r or chi, that means what do I get chi a 1 chi b 2 1 by r 1 to 1 minus 2 chi r 1 chi b 2 which is nothing but this. Please, please note this very carefully. So, if I do, so let me write the chi a the right hand side chi a f chi r. So, that is an integral in a full form chi a star 1 f of 1 chi r of 1 d tau 1, correct. So, the first term is chi a star 1 h of 1 
chi r 1 theta 1. That is clear because f is h. The second term has a summation, summation over b and now I have a further integration over d tau 2. So, I have two integration d tau 1, d tau 2, but first I have to write chi a star 1, correct? And then from the Fock operator I write chi b star 2, then I write the 1 by r 1 2, 1 minus p 1 2 and here I write coordinate 1 first, chi r 1 and then again chi b 2. I have an integration over d tau 2 and d tau 1, correct? Just in the long form I have written, quite clearly these two together is nothing but this. I hope all of you can see this, that this term sum over b, chi a chi b anti symmetrize chi r chi b. So, that is the meaning of anti symmetrize, 1 by r 1 2 is not written, we have a 1 minus p 1 2, so anti symmetry makes it exchange here on the right side. So, this, this is in the long form nothing but this expression, this entire expression. Is it clear to everybody? So, what I am arguing is that this quantity which is this expression is nothing but this quantity, chi a f chi r, okay. Please note very carefully, I am trying to go as slow as possible because I know that everybody is doing this first time. This leads to an extremely interesting theorem. What is chi a f chi r? Chi a f chi r is nothing but 0. Not because of this integral. But chi a f, can somebody tell me why? Note, note that chi r is an unoccupied orbitals, which is orthogonal to the occupied. So, you remember we have got an eigenvalue equation f chi a epsilon a chi a, where a is 1 to n and in fact all the r's are also eigenvalue equation, right? The unoccupied orbitals are also eigenvalue equation. So, obviously chi a f is nothing but epsilon a chi a, correct? So, if I put this here, this chi a f chi r is nothing but epsilon a chi a chi r, is it clear? And this is 0. So, provided the orbitals chi a, set chi a are orthonormal to the set r, any replacement from this orthonormal set actually gives you 0 because of the fact that these also satisfy an equation, eigenvalue equation like this. Now, one important thing is that I had a non-canonical equation, remember? Let us say I have a non-canonical, I have not solved the Hartree-Fock eigenvalue equation, but I have a non-canonical equation. So, B lambda b a epsilon a chi, chi b. This is now, note that when they did the non-canonical equation, they were still only within the occupied orbitals. They were number of electrons are n. Later on, I canonicalized. So, even in that case, this will become 0 because f chi a, f when acting on chi a, brings them only within the occupied space. So, each of the occupied orbitals are still orthogonal to chi r and hence it will become 0. So, let us do this exercise. So, let us write this up as a non-canonical Hartree-Fock equation. So, what will happen to chi a f? Can you now write this? Chi a f will be epsilon lambda b a, correct, which is Hermitian matrix. So, lambda b a star or whatever. If they are real number, you do not have to write. Chi b sum over b, correct, sum over b. You can put it star, it does not matter. Then what happens to chi a f chi r? It will become sum over b lambda b a chi b chi r, correct. So, instead of only one term, it will have a sum over b, but all chi b chi r's are 0, correct, because chi r is an unoccupied orbital which are orthogonal to all the occupied orbitals. So, as long as I have constructed unoccupied orbitals which are orthogonal to occupied orbitals, I do not care whether it is canonical or non-canonical. The only issue is that if it is canonical, then it is automatically ensured because unoccupied orbitals are also coming from the same operator eigenvalue equation. Since the operator is Hermitian, all entire orbitals are orthonormal. In this case, I get only occupied orbitals. Then I have to construct an 
a un unoccupied orbital basis which is orthogonal to each other. But as long as that, that is done, it will give you 0. So, it actually does not matter whether it is canonical or non-canonical. What, what is important is the fact that the unoccupied orbital should be orthogonal. So, let me state this that a psi naught h psi a r is 0 provided psi 0 is Hartree Fock, correct? Provided psi 0 is Hartree Fock, I do not care whether it is canonical or non canonical, and the unoccupied orbitals chi r, set chi r, are orthonormal or orthogonal actually to chi a. That is all that matters, okay? This is automatically satisfied provided I have a canonical equation because chi, chi r comes as a result of the operator eigenvalue equation and you know that if it is a Hermitian operator, all eigenfunctions are orthonormal. So, automatically chi r become orthonormal, otherwise I have to impose this. But as long as that is true, there is a very nice result that when I do ci, remember when this determinant will come, when I do ci, mcn, mcn. So, one of these will be Hartree Fock with singly excited. This is called the singly excited determinant. I will give a name for this now. And that is very clear why it is singly excited. From the Hartree Fock, you are exciting one electron from chi a to chi r. So, all singly, not singly excited state, please remember, singly excited determinant. State is a di different meaning because state should be eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. These are not eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, none of them. Because even psi 0 is not an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, it is a Hartree Fock approximation. So, singly excited determinant and the Hartree Fock determinant cannot be coupled through the Hamiltonian, okay. So, this matrix element is now 0. So, so that is a very important theorem provided this is Hartree Fock and I have again repeated the theorem. So, that is the statement of the theorem and this is very often called Brillouin's theorem. So, this theorem is called the Brillouin's theorem. I, we have already done the Koopmans. This is called Brillouin's theorem and in some sense Brillouin's theorem is a consequence of the Hartree Fock. It is very clear that this is a part of the Hartree Fock. So, as long as psi 0 is Hartree Fock, I construct a set of spin orbitals which are orthonormal and then the this determinant is 0. So, that is a Brillouin's theorem uh, and Brillouin's theorem will have a serious consequence when you do the later part of the correlation theory. So, Brillouin's theorem essentially this, this, this statement of this is just the Brillouin's theorem, okay. So, I have proved it by first applying Slater rule and then showing that that expression is nothing but chi a f chi r. And if it is chi a f chi r, because chi r's are orthonormal to chi a, it is 0. So, I think the mathematics is only really to write this letter rule here and identify that that is nothing but chi a f chi r. Okay. And please practice this letter rule. So, for example, take chi 1, chi 2, h, chi 1, chi 3. Note that you can again do spin integration. I have not done that. Again, you can do spin integration. So, for example, here the first term will be chi 2, h, chi 3, correct? That will be the first term. Then the second term will be sum over b equal to 1 to 2. Of course, here it is only 2, so it is very easy to write. And then you have the one that is, I just fix this here, chi 2 chi a anti symmetrized chi 3 chi a, where chi a will be 1 or 2. But of course, it cannot be 2. In this case, it is trivial. It obviously cannot be 3 anyway, so it has to be only 1. So there is only one term which survives. So for this case, I can straight away write it. So, this b equal to 1 to 2 goes off. So, I have only one term here, correct? And then you can do spin integration. Depending on what is chi 2, what is chi 1, what is chi 3, up spin, down spin, you can do the spin integration. So, again, same thing will happen. What will vanish, what will not vanish. But I hope this is an application of the Brillouin's theorem. I hope you understand because I had a sum, I had a sum over b but b has to be either 1 or 2, it cannot be 2, so only 1 survives. In fact, sum over b, b not equal to a, that is the easier way to write. So, again note, note this expression psi naught h psi a r 
I write it again. It is chi a h chi r plus all orbitals which are in psi 0 b but not equal to a 1 to n chi a chi b anti symmetrized chi r chi b. That is it. Now, you may write chi b first, chi a later, chi r, chi b first, chi r later, does not matter, that is identical. It is an anti symmetrized, so of course, you have the exchange term when you write it in full. So, I have, so this is the application to a simple two electron term, okay. Yeah. Any problem? You are not able to read anything, you just let me know. So, sum over b, b is not equal to a. So, for example, here it should have been 1 or 2, but it cannot be equal to 2, so only 1 survives. And whatever will come here will come here. And these are the two, uh, two which are different. So, here chi 2 is changed to chi 3, so that comes here. Okay. And you can, of course, write it the other way around in both cases, that is identical result. So, you have a cooled up minus exchange integral. So, this is how you should please practice this because these are new things that you are doing. Unless you do many practices, you will not be able to write. You can now take 3 electron. So, you can take 3 electron, for example, chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, one determinant, another you can take chi 1, chi 2, chi 4. So, the change is only chi 4. So, this term is very easy chi 3 h chi 4. This term you have to write properly now because b will be not 3, but b can be 1 and 2. So, there will be 2 terms. So, there will be just number of terms will increase, otherwise it is very easy. So, this will become chi 3 chi 1 chi 4 chi 1 chi 3 chi 2 chi 4 chi 2. So, the 2 terms will come, okay. All right. 